So again, this was another uh, lecture title that was given by Dr. Crawford previously. I've given a, a similar talk like this once before, and a lot of this will kind of feed into some of the other discussions you'll hear today. Um, so the learning objectives for this uh, section is to give an overview of relevant prostate anatomy and physiology and discuss some of the data between inflammation, which was discussed somewhat by Dr. Moyad, um, as it relates to both benign enlargement and prostate cancer. And then I'll briefly touch on the data regarding the microbiome and influence of disease in preparation for talks you're going to hear by both Dr. Nickel and uh, Rick Martin as well. So Dr. Crawford already showed uh, some uh, detailed statistics about the clinical burden of disease. Uh, nearly 70% of 70-year-olds have prostate cancer on autopsy. Well, soccer back at Wayne State uh, had shown that years ago. But in terms of clinical disease, BPH is still the most common uh, symptomatic urologic disease in older men, nearly half of your octogenarians. So prostate cancer and BPH generally form in different areas of the prostate, although we do know that transition zone cancers, for example, exist, but they're both considered chronic disease with slow progression. Prevalence of both goes up as we age, unfortunately. Both are hormone dependent, and both have been associated with inflammation. In terms of the physical structure of the prostate, it was first described by Dr. Lousley, like the Lousley retractor as having five lobes. However, unlike the rat, the humans have distinct zones within a relatively uniform gland. It's very similar to, if you imagine, like a bunch of grapes dipped into a, uh, a jello mold, so to speak. It's very similar to the lung in that sense. Okay, and there's a variety of cell types, and so the schematic at the bottom kind of shows the layout of these, but you have secretory epithelial cells. Below those, you have your basal or stem cells mixed with neuroendocrine cells, and then below that you have the stroma, which is a mixture of smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, and endothelial cells. So in terms of the fluid produced by the prostate, right, we have calocrines. That term became uh, much more well-known after the 4K score, right? PSA being calocrine 3, so these are enzymes. Remember, PSA is a serine protease. So it's rich in citrate, zinc, and prostate actually has the highest level of any soft tissue in terms of zinc, okay? And gets a lot of press for uh, fertility supplements, whether or not the evidence is really there in humans. Uh, spermine prostaglandins, named for the prostate, but somewhat of a misnomer because it's more heavily localized to the seminal vesicles. And uh, if you look down to the bottom, some of you may be seasoned enough to have ordered prostate acid phosphatase for prostate cancer patients uh, way back when. So zinc is accumulated within the epithelial cells, and uh, this constitutes 4% of a man's body content, possibly supported by prolactin stimulation. This next part is important when we talk about uh, cancer and BPH. So it blocks the Krebs cycle and causes accumulation of citrate, which is the energy substrate for sperm, and temporarily uh, inactivates the calocrines. The major zinc transporter is actually decreased or absent in prostate cancer compared to other tissue. So it's a hypothesized tumor suppressor. So, Many of you have seen slides like this before uh, in terms of the hormonal control of the prostate, but it is relevant to um, inflammation and uh, pathways for disease. Overwhelming majority of testosterone is bound to protein in the blood. Remember, the bond between albumin is weak, so it can break. It's less so with SHBG. A very small percentage is uh, floating around free and can diffuse into the prostate. But once within there, the majority is converted to DHT, which has a higher binding affinity for the androgen receptor, goes to the nucleus as a complex, and uh, leads to transcription. So the androgen receptor gene is a master gene. There's two forms, although there's no evidence of different roles, and there's a lot of mutations identified in prostate cancer lines. As we age, our testosterone levels and our DHT levels go down, and the prostate gland function is impaired. So this reduces the ability to maintain healthy levels of zinc and citrate and the calocrine balance. So fertility goes down, and it weakens the ability to inhibit that Krebs cycle. So that favors a cancer-prone status. We know from studies on eunuchs that if uh, someone's castrated before puberty, the prostate doesn't grow. Castration, either chemical or surgical after puberty, can cause gland reduction. However, if you give androgens back, the gland enlarges. And it, this is a joint process in terms of promoting inhibiting growth between androgens and estrogens through both receptors. In terms of innervation of the prostate, many of us are familiar with adrenergic and noradrenergic receptors based on how we treat BPH, side effects we see of certain cold remedies, for example. But there are also muscarinic receptors within the prostate, on the epithelium, within the stroma, and, and in certain cancer cell lines. We, I mean, anti-muscarinics right now aren't a primary cancer treatment, but you know, when you start to think about some of the research that's been published, you can kind of understand the logic. Data suggests these res uh, receptors may modulate prostate cancer growth, and cholinomimetics have been shown to contribute to proliferation. The prostate, very similar to the lung and intestine, is an immunocompetent organ. 
It's populated by lymphocytes, macrophages, and mast cells. And the immune responses are largely influenced by the hormonal milieu, which can affect the susceptibility to inflammation. Right? So in terms of the immunoactivity, the lymphocytes secrete cytokines, which then, through both paracrine and autocrine mechanisms, stimulate growth. So think of clinical associations. Right? Estrogen is a pro-inflammatory uh, molecule. Obesity is associated with higher estrog estradiol and higher inflammation. Metabolic syndrome was mentioned in some of Dr. Myatt's later slides. Some studies have shown that LUTs improve with reductions in obesity. So what about prostatitis, right? This diagnosis is thrown around a lot. The prevalence is quite high, leads to a number of hospital visits each year in our country, and was seen in a high percentage of men in the reduced trial. And Dr. Nickel may talk more about this later. But it's divided into the categories that we're well familiar with, but it was suggested to be causative of pathology of BPH as early as the 30s. Okay? And in terms of the relationship with cancer, this is not answered in, in definite as of yet because there's a lot of data on one side, but then there's also some data on the other side. The California Men's Health Study looked at over 68,000 men, and prostatitis was considered a significant risk factor for prostate cancer. The longer you had it, the higher your risk. Meta-analysis of 20 studies also showed a significant association. Uh, there was mention uh, just earlier this morning talking about daily intake of NSAIDs, primarily aspirin, and we talked about heart health, but has been associated with risk of reduction for prostate cancer. But I very rarely come across a provider who recommends this to their patients. Uh, Curtis Nickel and I had talked uh, here at this meeting uh, years ago about his findings looking at the reduced trial data, which actually showed that more baseline inflammation on a negative biopsy may be associated with a lower cancer risk on a later biopsy, and hopefully he'll talk about that uh, later on this afternoon. The microbiome also has a couple of devoted uh, discussions later today, but analysis is now feasible through molecular-based assays, okay? So we have a, access to a library of probes, so you can identify uh, the complicated mix of bacteria within the prostate. It doesn't necessarily give us all the answers as to what each one is doing, but we know that urine and the prostate itself are not sterile environments as we once thought. And the bacterial populations may differ between benign settings and those within malignant tissue but it's unclear which promotes which. So the concept of infection leading to cancer is not new, right? Virchow had proposed this back in the 1800s, and many of us are familiar with the relationship between H. pylori and gastric cancer. It was, however, first proposed for the development of prostate cancer in the early 50s, and there has been an association with prostate cancer risk and gene variants of things like COX-2, right? Uh, ribonuclease uh, L, which is uh, important for uh, immune defense against viruses. Uh, Toll-like receptor 4, which um, among other things uh, helps to recognize like the LPS, lipopolysaccharide, uh, for things like E. coli. And those have been identified in cases of hereditary prostate cancer. An analysis of uh, radical prostatectomy specimens showed that the majority contained enterobacter. So uh, what we've previously referred to as P. acnes or propionobacterium is now called cutobacterium, okay? And there's been a number of publications, and Dr. Crawford has been involved in some of this research as well, to show that this is abundant within prostate tissue and it is hormonally responsive, right? The population will go up in the presence of higher levels of testosterone. And it has a pro-inflammatory role. And it's been associated with prostate cancer, and in some studies when comparing cancerous tissue to normal tissue, it was only in the cancer bucket. So it's been suggested as both an initiator or a promoter. It was reported in, in uh, 78 to 95% of prostate cancer specimens and 100% of pin lesions, and was actually shown to be predictive of cancer and subsequent biopsies for elevated PSA. So what are my conclusions for this uh, kind of a general talk? Well, it's, again, it should be looked at as kind of a lead-in to perhaps you know, put things in perspective and kind of recall some of the things you may have learned early in your education and training. But the prostate is an immunocompetent an androgen-dependent organ of fertility, but the direct target of a number of benign and malignant diseases. Impairment of the status of epithelium can decrease accumulation of zinc and citrate and affect secretion of the calocrines. Inflammation is associated with both BPH and prostate cancer, but as of now, the data cannot truly confirm causality. Thank you.